we're really excited to get into today's edition of What Works Side Hustle 101. Um, but before we do, we would like to take a moment and acknowledge the traditional territories we are situated on. We would like to acknowledge that SATE is situated on the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy. The city of Calgary encompasses a region that the Blackfoot tribes of Southern Alberta, described as Mokinsis, meaning elbow, in reference to its location at the confluence of the Bow and Elbow Rivers. This region was a traditional gathering place for the tribes of the Blackfoot Confederacy. We are meeting on the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, which today encompasses the Indigenous peoples of the Treaty 7 region in Southern Alberta. The Siksika, the Pikani, the Gainai, the Sutena, the Stony Nakoda First Nations, the Northwest Métis Homeland Region 3. Recognizing this is a virtual event and we may not all be located in the same place, I encourage you to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional territories in which you reside on. We would also like to take a moment to thank our generous sponsor, More Investment Management, for making the What Works Career Speaker Series a reality. Okay, so let's get into it. I'm sure many of you are here because you've either been thinking about starting up a little side gig, or perhaps you're in the midst of running your own side hustle. Whatever the reason, we're glad that you're here and we're excited to learn from some state alumni who are doing just that. Some have converted it into a full-time career. Some are doing it on the side. Either way, I'm thrilled for them to share what their experiences have been like and hopefully you'll get some meaningful and inspiring takeaways from today. We received some excellent questions from many of you ahead of today and we'll be getting to most of them throughout the webinar. But if you have any questions along the way, feel free to pop them into the Q&A and we'll leave some time at the end where we will try and get to as many of them as we can. Okay, so I'm gonna go and introduce, go ahead and introduce our guests today. Um, I'll do a brief int intro for each of them and then I'll let them take it away and dive a little bit deeper into who they are, what they do and what their main reason was for pursuing a side hustle. Albert Miles Mejia graduated from both the Aircraft Structures Technician and Business Administration programs here at SATE. He was also recognized as an outstanding young alumni in 2017. He's the owner and founder of Legal Hustle Clothing, the creator of YYC Soldiers Calgary Sneaker Community, co-founder of the Western Canada Crump Pioneer Dance Crew, Empirical Freedom, and is also the creative director of By Miles Print and Design. Kathy Provencher graduated from the Radio, Television and Broadcast News Diploma Program, where she majored in broadcast news back in 2009. She has a super colorful career, which includes working in roles for on-air and promotions at several radio stations in Calgary, including 660 News, X929, APTN, 98.5 Virgin Radio, and CJ92. And you may have also seen or heard Kathy as a helicopter reporter for Global News and News Talk 770. She is now the CEO and founder of Perry Doe and Poppy Digital. Jen Geiger is a graduate of the Architectural Technology and Graphic Design programs here at SATE. She founded Cheeky Canvas Creative Studio in 2012 while working full-time and has been able to develop a creative or creative marketing solutions with clients like the Calgary Zoo, University of Calgary, and Toolshed Brewing, to name a few. Jen has been able to merge her two credentials that she earned from SATE and is working full-time as a graphic designer for an interior construction company while working with her own clients through her side business. And last but not least, Luis Paulo Alves is originally from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, and he's lived in Canada and the US for almost two decades now. He's a graduate of the Travel and Tourism Diploma Program. He served as VP Academic for SESA and has since crafted a successful career in the tourism industry as a sales leader. He's currently full-time uh, leading a team of account managers covering all of Western Canada with booking.com and recently expanded his professional repertoire by adding licensed realtor to his resume. So Albert, I'll let you take it away and dive a little deeper um, into what got you started. Um, hey guys, thanks again for taking the time to come join us for the speaker series. Um, kind of just jumping into it. So when I was younger, I've always been into sneakers, fashion and, and dance, um, everything from street culture, from hip hop, rap, and everything else in between so I'm huge into art as you might you guys might see there's some art behind me with Tupac and Mac Miller and stuff um, but a lot of this stuff inspired me 
And fashion was one of the things that kind of um, really captivated me growing up. And for me, I always had this dream of starting my own clothing line. Uh, so long story short, I started a clothing line back in 2011. Um, and uh, from that, I built a, a small brand while I was working full time as an aircraft structures technician. And then from there, I kind of decided a year after owning the business and starting it up, I uh, took some of the money that I, I made working full time and, and jumped back into business um, at SAIT. Not only for the diploma, but it was for me being at the age of 21 when I started my business, um, I thought it would be perfect time to network. So during my time, I kind of just uh, networked with all the you know, students that I went to school with and all the people that I was around and started building my brand more and more from there. And at the same time as building my brand, uh, sneakers, you know, for me was all about building a foundation for fashion. So in order for you to look good, you got to build your foundations and what better way to start your foundations with your sneakers. Uh, so I started YYC Soldiers after taking a trip to Hawaii and seeing how the sneaker community is there. And yeah, so it kind of just steamrolled from creating a clothing brand um, and then building a community with sneakers and then kind of just rolling it off um up there so it started off as a side hustle um, and then in 2018 uh, life kind of took a turn uh, for the positive for me uh, where I left my nine to five working for SETSA and I took um, my business full time and that's when I created by Miles Design and Print Studios where now I don't only just work with my own brand but I work with other small businesses uh, across the city and around Canada. Amazing. Thank you so much, Albert. Kathy? Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining our panel today. Um, yeah, so as Alyssa was saying, I uh, did some television and radio after graduating SAIT. Uh, while I was working in the industry, I was finishing my degree. So I did my two plus two, um, uh, like two years at SAIT and then two years at post-secondary. So I did UFC and Athabasca because I was actually working all these wonky hours working in radio and flying up in the helicopter. So I couldn't go to traditional school per se, um, but I slowly chipped away at that. And then I transitioned into the event side of things. So I worked in nonprofit, I did marketing. So I was marketing director at Jameson's Pubs here for a couple of years. And then I transitioned into um, working on a national level for marketing um, for Good Earth Coffee House. So I supported 50 plus coffee houses with their social media and marketing plans and kind of everything in between. And I just learned and absorbed so much through that role. And then cue the pandemic. I ended up actually getting temporarily laid off uh, in March of 2020, which was kind of a big hit. At that same time, my wedding got postponed and all these fun things were kind of happening to my life. But looking back, um, they've been blessings for sure. So when I got laid off, you know, I had the thought of, you know, I always had that nudge to kind of go off and do my own thing. Or I was always talking to friends who had businesses and they're like, Kathy, you should, you should help people with their marketing. You should help them with your social or you should help, you know, contract out photography. But I always had that safety net at Good Earth Coffee House. And I, I felt like I had a great boss. I loved what I did. And it was just high, such high risk at that point. But when I lost my job, um, I was forced to find another role. So I ended up taking a corporate contract for a little bit. And long story short, I absolutely hated it. <laughs> it just like, it, it killed my creativity. I was working in an environment um, corporately where it was just like working nonstop from like 7 a.m. to 7 p.m not getting much sleep, you know, uh, not being able to really dive deep into my creative juices. Um, so I had a point where I, you know, I thought, you know, I really kind of want to go for this, even though it's the thick of a pandemic. Um, when I got the corporate contract role, the owner of Jameson's Pubs, who I used to do marketing for, reached out to me and they, they were like, hey, we miss your social media. Can we contract you out for social media? So I was doing that on the side of my corporate contract role, which kind of got me thinking like, hey, 
contract could kind of work. We'll see how this goes. So when I hit the point where I realized my mental health mattered way more than any job, and I really wanted to follow my gut and my dreams. So I sat down with my husband and I was like, I have a crazy idea. <laughs> I'm gonna launch my own thing. Um, it might not work. I might need to be a barista or serve while I build this, but I got to do this. I just have this urge that I got to follow my dreams. And um, also more importantly, my morals, you know, as working in an environment where morally, we are marketing to um, an extent that didn't feel good. And I really wanted to lead with my values and um, show the personality and showing the humans behind brands. Um, that's something that really resonates um, with me. So um, I did the thing. I left the corporate job and I officially launched my business. I think the biggest thing from a creative standpoint is um, you'll never feel ready. I feel like I finessed my website a million times before I actually launched. <laughs> and um, but when I put the word out there, beautiful things happened. You know, people I hadn't talked to in years were like, hey, I know someone or I need some support. Um, so my biggest thing was supporting small businesses that needed marketing and social media support or photography. Um, and working with agencies can be expensive. I've seen it on the national side where it's $110 an hour to get small things done. Not many small businesses, especially during the pandemic, can afford that. So I wanted to lead with you know, affordable rates while respecting my time, right? Uh, but, and lead with values. So ever since I've kind of blossomed into uh, working with so many different types of small businesses across the city. I launch social media workshops and marketing business plan workshops where it just gives small businesses that leg up. And I've been fortunate enough that a couple of businesses have signed me on to manage and run their socials. And I'm happy to say a couple months ago or in the summer, actually, I hired my first employee, which was super exciting. So it grew way faster than I thought. And I think the biggest thing is just um, being positive. And, you know, it is scary launching your own thing, especially when it is contract work. Um, but I know at the end of the day, I have the skills to make it through whatever comes my way. So leading with love, leading with light. And um, it, I just, I feel very fortunate. And I'm I'm so happy that things worked out the way they did. In March of 2020, everything felt like the end and it was actually my beginning. So um, thank you so much for your time and listening to all of us today. Lovely, thank you, Kathy. Over to you, Jen. Hi everyone. Thanks Alyssa and State alumni for having me today. Uh, my name is Jen, I'm a graphic designer. I started my business, Cheeky Canvas Creative, um, about 10 years ago, just to make a little bit of extra money while I was building my design portfolio. Uh, prior to that, I had graduated from State's Architectural Technology Program. And so I was working full time and started to get into the marketing side of new home construction and really liked it. So went back um, to night school at State and got, uh, after, I think it took me about three or four years to get through all the courses. and. Um, once I was about to graduate, I started Cheeky Canvas um, just as a way to, to build that portfolio and get a little bit more experience. Um, and it was nice to be able to make a little bit of money while I was doing that. Um, so fast forward, I, I've had Cheeky Canvas going for about 10 years. I'm a mom to two little girls. And so freelancing actually granted me the flexibility to take an extended parental leave and still provide a source of income. So that was really nice. And it was nice to be able to be at home while my girls were little. Um, and today I'm working full-time for an interior construction company headquartered in Calgary. Um, and I still freelance to broaden my skills and earn a bit of a supplemental income because let's be real, kids are expensive. Thanks, Jen. And I think life in general is just expensive with how inflation is going today too. So yeah, side <laughs> hustles are really nice. Uh, Luis. Yes, thank you, everybody. Um, hello, my name is Luis. Um, after my time at SAIT, I went uh, moved to the West Coast to go for my bachelor's degree. And basically, right after that, <clears throat> I started my career uh, at Booking. I was very fortunate to have a pretty quick uh, growth with, within the company and 
travel is my passion. You know, everyone who knows me knows that uh, my career is something I really cherish. I'm really passionate about the company, but I also always wanted to work for myself. I just never pulled the plug. I never had, you know, the idea or anything like that. And if I'm being really honest, you know, with uh, with everyone here, my my biggest motivator, what really made me uh, uh, pull the plug at this point was fear. Uh, similar to, to Kathy here, during the pandemic, I legitimately felt like I could lose my job, you know, and I had a child on the way. Uh, I had no plan B and that freaked me out. You know, it just showed me how unprepared I was for uh, something that big. Um, so I really started thinking, you know, what I could do uh, in anticipation of possibly being laid off. I didn't know if I was going to be laid off uh, or not. And I decided to make several different investments in myself uh, and my family. And this career in real estate was the result of, of one of those investments. So with my sales background, my account management background, it just really made sense. Um, and I think at the end of the day, it's kind of cool that in my nine to five, I help people to experience the world. And on my side gig, I help people find their dream home, you know, so it's pretty, pretty rewarding uh, to see those two things come together. Perfect. Thank you so much. All right. So I'm going to go into our first question. Um, so you, you've all shared the biggest reason for going out on your own, but can you take us through what some of the first steps that you took were to get started? Um, Kathy, I feel like you touched on this already, but I mean, if there was any, anything you may have missed, um, feel free to elaborate. Um, yeah, anyone can jump in whenever. I would say I chatted and either virtually chatted or went for coffee or tea, depending on restrictions, <laughs> um, with entrepreneurs that I knew of already. And I picked their brain before I officially incorporated. I said, you know, what's the differences between sole proprietorship and incorporating? I connected with ATB and chatted with their strategists. Um, and I also got involved with a bunch of different organizations that support small business owners here in Alberta. So ATB has a lot of resources um, for women, like there's uh, Alberta women entrepreneurs, there's futurepreneurs. So there's, uh, that's for entrepreneurs under 35 years old. Um, I am AT, so uh, uh, leaning into lots of indigenous resources and, um, uh, yeah, there's been a lot of like networking, free seminars, you know, just absorbing everything I could before I actually launched. And I also talked to a bookkeeper before I officially launched and I had him talk to me about the differences between sole proprietorship and incorporating and weighing the pros and cons because there are lots with both. I'm glad you mentioned that because we will touch on that as well. Jen? Yeah, and just to add on to what Kathy was saying, it's really important to explore what sort of liabilities your business are subject to because it kind of dictates what, what type of business you're going to register, whether you, you start out just with a registered trade name or, you know, a sole proprietorship or partnership. Um, it's just important to keep that in mind. And um, yeah, just, just think about that sort of thing and liability-wise to keep, keep yourself on track. Yeah, and to add on to that, um, you always want to pick the brains of the people that interest you um, before really hopping into it. Personally, for myself, I'm in the streetwear industry, and there's nobody here in Calgary that's doing streetwear. Um, I mean, now there's a lot more, but I felt like when I started 11 years ago, I was kind of asking questions to people that own stores like skate shops and stuff but their views were different because owning a brick and mortar was different than starting a clothing brand so for me I actually traveled to LA and to New York and took whatever seminars I could um, on my uh, student loans because personally for me it was an investment uh, because as much as I was learning in school you're kind of learning what the books are teaching you but depending on what industry you want to get into, you, you can't really learn until you're hands on and kind of uh, also doing it and, and just connecting with the 
um, the people that you look up to. So for myself, I looked up to a couple brands and I was actually able to meet with some of the owners and the people that started these brands and kind of pick their brains a bit. Um, social media was like Instagram was still kind of new. Uh, LinkedIn was still kind of new, but those were the opportunities that I had where you can kind of DM someone and they would they would get back to you. Um, it's a little bit harder now because everyone's on social media and, you know, some people are verified. It's harder for them to get your messages because they might have thousands and thousands of messages going through. But I think I got lucky for myself um, in the early times of, of social media where I was able to connect with some um, people around the world and then even just travel to meet and take some of their seminars and online courses. I took a lot of online courses before it was a huge thing now. I wouldn't really add much uh, to what was, was said. I would echo uh, a lot of what was said, just tons of research uh, on my end and reaching out to as many people as I could uh, within my network, outside my network. A lot of people didn't respond, uh, but the people that did were super helpful and it was very, very beneficial. Great, thank you. Um, one of the questions that came in from our guests was about whether you had any specific resources, books, influencers, or mentors that inspired you to maybe take this direction? Are you ready for the uh, list? <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. I mean, there's tons. Um, I, I think in my industry now, in real estate, uh, a big one um, for me is Ryan Serhant. Uh, he's like a big, big name in real estate, the author of Big Money Energy, um, most of you probably would have seen him on the reality shows and things like that, but definitely a, a big, uh, a big inspiration. Uh, also a, a Calgarian called Nolan Matthias. He has a, a really cool, um, YouTube channel. He's an economist and mortgage broker, um, from Calgary, uh, mortgage 360 is his company. I follow a lot uh, of his contact. I'm actually reading one of his books right now. Uh, the mortgage millionaire highly recommend. It's a great read. Um, and I mean, the, the list goes on. I have so many uh, people that I look up to uh, in the industry and, you know, that I try to seek out content, but I would say those two are some of my biggest resources for sure. I would say I listen to lots of different podcasts, um, research lots of different YouTube channels and researched digital marketing agencies, not only across Canada, but across the world, like looking at New York agencies, um, you know, just across the board, you know, just for inspiration. Um, I would say I had a really amazing boss and mentor at Good Earth Coffee House that I stay in contact with. So I would poke her a lot. And I think the biggest thing to stay inspired is leaning into your community, leaning into your people. I have amazing friends. I have an amazing best friend that I bounce ideas off all the time. My husband's super supportive and, you know, family members, my, my in-laws are amazing. So I think drawing inspiration from people who believe in you is crucial. Um, and that has really kind of helped me so much through this journey. Any other influencers or people that you think you would like to give a shout out to? Um, kind of just touching back to what I said, like I I was very intrigued by a lot of brands. One of the also, one of the other reasons I also wanted to start my own brand was I was also tired of putting money into these multi billion dollar businesses. That you know I'm a creative. I was born a creative, um, and I had all these ideas. Like I started trying to make my own t-shirts when I was in grade 11 because I you know I, I had these ideas that I've always wanted to put out there I just didn't know any of the techniques for print I thought spray painting on the t-shirt would be a good idea and using acrylic paint and it's a lot of stuff that I learned over all the years um, even customizing sneakers was was one of the things but uh, I I read a lot of books on um, on sneakers uh you know, like different customizers. A lot. I read a lot of books on um, different like t-shirt uh, designs just to kind of um, build ideas because in fashion, everything cycles. Right now we're in the age for in the industry, we're in industry, it's the age of vintage uh, and everything that came from the 80s, 90s is all coming back. A lot of the 
um the new generation is all about y2k so that was only 22 years ago and and now it's circling back into fashion um so for me it was a lot of books and magazines that i had over all the years um and i constantly watch youtube videos of how to print on t-shirts regardless if i've watched the video 50 times or regardless if 10 different um, youtubers that i watched talk about the same thing it's all about repetition because there's going to come a time where a client is going to come up to me and say I want to get this design and what you're thinking might not actually work but there's one youtuber that had a technique that actually could help you with uh, printing the design so um, ju just dive dive in and suck everything up as much as you can like a sponge because if you're kind of blocking whatever is coming your way you're missing out on a lot of uh, information that could be coming and be useful for you um, later on in the future. I think a lot of it for me I got a lot of learning and details when I was in the aviation industry because when you're staring at a million dollar airplane and you don't want to mess it up you got to learn quick. <laughs> Um, okay, that's awesome. Um, Jen, did you have any people that you wanted to mention or? Quite honestly, I had no idea who to ask when I was first starting out. Um, I was quite naive and so I just spent a lot of time Googling and um, on the government website too because I, while I was really eager to start a business, I really had zero business acumen and didn't know where to start. So don't feel bad if you're not sure who to talk to. Just Go on, go on Google, check out some forums, um, follow people who inspire you on Instagram, and the rest will come. You'll figure it out as you go. So just, just be confident in that. Awesome. And that actually reminds me, um, for those of you who are watching, State does have an alumni business directory. And since I find our alumni are such a tight knit group, like, um, and there are three of the people on this call are on it. So if you if there's a business that kind of resonates with you and you're not like, you're kind of curious, you can probably reach out to them through there. So, um, all right. So outside of the standard equipment and software requi required to run your business, were there any surprise costs with starting up? Your time. Uh, Kathy mentioned time and when I first started um, opening up my business to print things for more clients, I knew there was an hourly rate, I just didn't know what my hourly rate was. Uh, there's a thing called imposter syndrome and I'm sure everyone has heard of it where you start doubting yourself and you start thinking, you know, especially in entrepreneurship, can I really do this? You know, am I, am I as good as this company or am I as good as that person? But if you really believe in your craft, um, you know, people will believe in your hourly rates or in what you do. There's a, there's, you know, trust is a big thing in entrepreneurship and for business owners. Um, and it's all about setting your foundations right. If, uh, so I, I find that for me it was time. I didn't know exactly what it would cost me to do certain things. And but the more and more I kind of learned, and again, going back to diving into learning online and learning every day, that's kind of where I developed and, and understood my process and, and knew, you know, time, time is money, but at the same time, you got to value your customer as much as you value what they put into you in an investment. I would second that times a million. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of late nights, a lot of early mornings, a lot of weekends. I think um, sometimes being an entrepreneur seems glamorous and there's a lot of, you know, blood, sweat and tears behind the scenes. Um, yeah. And, and learning how to balance your time and knowing what your time is worth for me, um, being a self-proclaimed people pleaser, sometimes I go like, too much like if i'm editing a photo shoot and i've taken 400 pictures for a client and normally it's about 
50, 60 that are usually like delivered, I'll give them 330 because I think they're all beautiful. But that time of editing every single one will catch up to you. So it's learning balance with yourself. Um, but when it's something you're passionate about, it's hot, it's really hard to, to balance that time. But you, the whole reason that I feel like a lot of entrepreneurs uh, launch is because they want that work-life balance, but sometimes it can teeter onto the opposite. So it's kind of just being um, on top of that and and connecting with others and other entrepreneurs and talking through um, that. I, I connected with Business Link and we had, um, it's every quarter, but that you can connect with other entrepreneurs and they're from different sectors. So then you can lean into each other about your um, strengths, weaknesses, and you know, your struggles. And uh, one really amazing man was like getting after me about my photo shoots and how many pictures I was delivering. Cause he's like, that's not sustainable. And I was like, I know, I know, I know. So it's kind of leaning into others. And uh, yeah, I agree, Albert, time is the biggest, biggest piece. I'll echo that for sure, but for anyone considering a career in real estate, definitely do your research because every province is going to be different, but it is a costly setup, um, especially if you want to incorporate right away uh, and things like that. So you really need to know uh, what you're getting yourself into. Um, Excel spreadsheets are probably going to be your best friend there. Uh, it's really like put it down to, you know, exactly the dollar amount you're going to spend because it can definitely add up if you're not ready for it. Yeah, and then um, there can be a lot of hidden costs that you don't really realize at first. So, I mean, you're, you're paying to register your business, you're paying to start a website, secure those domains, um, the software you need, maybe subscriptions you need. Um, one of the biggest surprises for me was just, um, when I had to get going with payroll, when I when I did have an employee, um, just sustaining that and um, having a membership to the software so that you know the right amount of taxes were taken off, that sort of thing. Um, there can be a lot of hidden costs. So before you dive in with both feet, make sure that you've really done your research and it it's the risk is worth the reward. Uh, speaking of that software like the payroll one for example one that came through from one of our guests was what tool do you use to track your finances yeah so for me um, i found this great tool online it's actually free accounting software um, called wave accounting and so you can start up your own account and you can even charge credit cards there is a fee associated with that but it, it's a really straightforward way, especially for those of us who don't have any sort of accounting background to track your expenditures. Um, you can send invoices from there. Um, it's, a, it's a really great tool. So Wave Accounting, definitely check that one out. I, I'm very old school. I still like using uh, Excel. Um, just for me, I'm, I like writing things down. And when I write it down, I like to put it on my computer. It just for me, I can see where I can make where I would make my mistakes if anything doesn't balance. Uh, but when it comes to a lot of my payments, a lot of it is just through, you know, Square. Um, Square does a lot of that for me. And it just I can download a PDF or an Excel uh, through Square or through PayPal. Uh, so a lot of that, I kind of that's how I balance a lot of stuff. But a lot of the stuff that I'm spending on, um, I right away, I always put things into an Excel sheet just because it's for my eyes. And probably handy for your accountant too, right? Oh, my accountant loves me for that. <laughs> <laughs> Same here, uh, especially in the initial phase of my business now, but uh, it's mostly me doing it manually, but also in the market for uh, real estate focused accountant to help me out with you know what i'm getting myself into is definitely the biggest uh, piece for me right now but i believe eventually i will probably need some sort of software for sure i uh hired a bookkeeper i one of a, a big piece of advice uh, i got from an entrepreneurial friend was if you're not great at numbers suck it up pay for a bookkeeper because they can handle everything for you and it's kind of the same thing with companies who hire me for social media marketing, if it's not their niche, 
it's, you know, it's easier to just pay someone who's like an expert at it than to try and struggle on your own. And I know I'd probably struggle on my own for many hours. So speaking of time being money, I realized that that was an investment worth worth pursuing. So um, my bookkeeper basically does everything. Any like invoices I have, any expenses I have, I just file it away. And then he handles it. We, we connect, uh, you know, monthly, but like a deep dive kind of quarterly. And he answers all the vanilla questions that I have about accounting because numbers, like I said, are not my thing. So for me, that was a big, that is the biggest expense I have in my business, but it eases a ton of stress. So that works for me, but I know a lot of people and depending on your business too, um, there, there is great software out there that can support you as well. But for me, at least in this stage of my business, um, my bookkeeper is my best friend. He also works for the CRA. So I, I know that it's going to be good. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Worth it. Yeah. Amazing. So I know uh, Luis and Jen have already kind of alluded to it being incorporated, but um, what path did you choose? Um, was it incorporated? Was it sole proprietorship? And can you tell, tell us about why you went that path? Yeah, so for me, um, when I started out, I, I registered a trade name to start um, and then transitioned to a sole proprietorship. And But I realized as my business grew, I needed to pivot. And so um, now Cheeky Canvas is a partnership. Um, my husband is the co-owner. He's an avid photographer and tech whiz, so he gets involved with projects from time to time um, and helps with business development, lead generation sort of thing. Um, and that being said, it's important to research the tax implications because when you be, when you go from being a sole proprietorship to a partnership, you can you can divide um, kind of the revenue that's coming in. So when it comes to tax time, you can kind of maximize your return that way. So, so make sure um, you're doing your research because it can impact your bottom line depending on which route you take. And just to I, clarify, partnership is different from incorporated or is that just a part of it? Yeah, so incorporation is like the next level and I'm not sure if any of the panelists here can speak to that today, but um, it does have more legal implications. So, um, is anyone incorporated here? No. Go ahead, Albert, I interrupted you. Yeah. No, I was just gonna say, um, when we started off, like we were just college students. So I had to kind of pick one of my instructor's brains the second day of class, cause he mentioned, um, he mentioned partner or sole proprietorship, partnership and then incorporation. And he kind of broke everything down for me. Uh, where he was just saying, like, at the time, I had a business partner, so he was giving me the option of the partnership, but then he kind of talked me into the incorporation, because uh, one of the things he mentioned was, do you plan on getting bigger? And, of course, my answer was yes. So he kind of just talked me into a way of, you know, get all the legal stuff done now as, like, good practice, um, and then build up and build. So you're going to be paying more when you're incorporated. Uh, but the thing that really um, got me uh, influenced more into the incorporated side was being able to split everything. So I actually wanted to have Legal House of Clothing as its own entity and separated from myself, you know, uh, just because when it comes to tax time, I didn't, there's a lot of things when you're a student, you're kind of, you're doing taxes for student loans and stuff, um, as well as if you're working and I didn't want to mix that in with my business so that was kind of where he told me about separating it and splitting the entity of uh, being an incorporated uh, business. Yeah for me um, <clears throat> right now I am a sole proprietor but with real estate we have what we call um, personal real estate corporations right so uh, there are some some nuances and costs attached to it. So for me at the moment, my business just doesn't generate enough cash flow to justify it. So it doesn't make sense. But after a couple of transactions, it will 100% uh, make a lot of sense because especially with real estate, it's it's the type of profession that is 
overlooked by so many different bodies, right? And it's very heavy on litigation and stuff like that. So you definitely want to separate your assets, you know, for the personal name and the company itself. You probably want to have a, a holding company also where this corporation is going to be uh, under. So there's a lot of, of nuances that definitely uh, float around incorporating in real estate um, because it's also about pulling money out of your business, right? How will you do that uh, with the holding company? It's a little bit more uh, um, friendly on the taxes side of things. So I'm not an accountant. So I would once again, always recommend you speaking to an accountant before making any decisions. Um, but still, it's uh, definitely on the plan, uh, but just not right now due to cost. Yeah, I incorporated from the get-go kind of same thing with Albert where I wanted to scale and grow. So I wanted to just do everything up front. Um, but I did weigh the pros and cons both with entrepreneurs I knew, uh, my bookkeeper and also ATB and talking to other strategists. And, and they kind of would offer their suggestions. Um, but for me, that kind of made the most sense. There is a lot of a lot less personal liability when you incorporate as well. Um, so that was a kind of a key piece too. But yeah, for me, it was for being able to scale and grow. Thank you. Um, so just curious, um, you know, having a full-time gig um, or even a part-time one and just managing your side business, like how, are, how do you avoid burning the candle at both ends? Because it's not just work. You also have a life. You have, you know, family, friends, things like that. How do you... Um, you know, keep your mental health kind of in check and your your health in check? Well, for me, it's been mindfulness, just kind of being aware of when you're starting to feel that burnout. Uh, when you're first starting out, you're more inclined to just say yes to everything. Um, and it's important to set those boundaries to prevent that burnout and really just take on the projects that are actually going to help you grow. Um, and from time to time, I'll send my clients a note saying, hey, just so you know, I'm going to be away from my desk for this amount of time, take a couple of weeks away. And um, thankfully, with, with my freelancing, I, I'm able to take that time away. I'm not sure how, not sure how much everyone else here will, would be able to do that, but mindfulness is key for sure. Just to, uh, to add on to that too, um, I was the same way where uh, even as a dancer, I said yes to every gig when I was younger and on my body, it took a lot. Um, pay wise, it wasn't the greatest, but you know, everyone it's like, oh yeah, we'll help you get exposure. And that was a thing that you kind of thought about when you were younger was to get exposure, get your name out there. Um, but one of the things that now that really get, keep me going is, is my family. Um, I know Kathy said that too. Um, and Jen, where it's just like, you have to have a strong foundation of people that support you. Um, so my wife was actually the one that pushed me into uh, going full-time with my business because she just saw how um, how drained I was working um, working in an office. And, and don't get me wrong, working in the office is great, but just coming home, it was um, it was tiring, you know, because you want to push your business and, and being a creative sometimes when you're burning out there's some things that you do have to let go. Uh, so for myself, it was making sure I had a strong foundation. Uh, and then when my son was born, I just, I hustled harder. It was just one of those things where he was born months before the pandemic happened. Um, so he was born in October of 2019. And then when the pandemic happened, I was already working hard, but it was just like, I need to survive. You know, as a small business, I don't want to let this go. What am I going to do or what do I have to do to survive? So it was a lot of transitioning from there, but I had a very strong um, foundation within my family. I would say a couple things. Um, number one, time blocking is key. So it's kind of like, you know, in school, you have math in the morning and then social studies in the morning. And then in the afternoon, you have 
social, I don't know, you know, time blocking the school. Um, I do that with my work. So if I have a morning of editing photo shoots, I'll do that because I'm in that mindset. And if I have an afternoon of doing marketing plans, I'll do that. Or I'll have days that are specific to meetings so that I will get dressed ready and book my meetings. So it's efficient. Um, I would say to boundaries with yourself and boundaries with people close to you. So uh, love my husband, but he's got a lot of energy and he is someone that like on the fly is like, let's go to the farmer's market. Let's go for a hike in Banff. Let's do this. And um, old me would love that, but as an entrepreneur, I can't. So um, I'll show him my time block for my weekends and saying, I am free. <laughs> From one to four, you got me. What do you want to do? Um, and, and that's hard sometimes, but um, being upfront and honest about your time is really, really key. And then taking that time to fill your cup. I went to the mountains this past weekend and I've been working really hard like this whole month. And I was able to disconnect for two days with friends and uh, we were in the mountains, we we're having fun. We laughed so hard and that just, you know, filled my cup more with energy. So I felt rejuvenated for this week. So making sure you prioritize that. And that's a flaw of mine. I need to make sure that I do that a bit more so that you don't burn out. I think the, what I would add is that, you know, if, if I'm being really honest and you're really dedicated to your business, you want to succeed, you probably will burn the candle at both ends at some point, you know, like you're going to have some sacrifices, right? Like that's part of succeeding, um, I feel, but it is crucial to have your support system, you know, having my son really gave me like that jolt, you know, like you hustle harder because you want to provide, you know, you want to be an example. Uh, you don't want to fail in a lot of ways, you know, and, but more than I think just making time for your family, you know, filling your cup. I love that, that, that expression. Uh, I think you need to make time for yourself too. You know, I try to wake up as early as I can every day to take at least like two hours of me time. You know, I do whatever I want. I read, I catch up with friends, I work, I, study whatever it is but I try to make sure I carve out that time for myself um, and sometimes you just have to you know disconnect you know you have a lot going on but it's important to pick your battles too um, and Headspace app is a, is a big one for me I use it on the daily so mindfulness is, is key yeah those apps are great there's like Headspace Insight Timer Calm um, I know I think a lot of state students have access to Headversity as well, which is a really great one and it's local. Um, but just being um, aware of the time that we have left, we've got 10 minutes and we had a question come in. So for those of you who want to maybe ask a question, feel free to pop it into the Q&A. This one's from Freddie and he said or asked, what do you think is the biggest roadblock that you've had to deal with and how did you deal with it? I think mine has always just been imposter syndrome. That's like, you're playing mind games with yourself. Um, and you're always, as an entrepreneur and as like a human being, it's just normal for us to kind of compare sometimes to our friends, to our families. Like, you know, um, you could look at one of your friends and be like, how did they get there? You know, but you don't really, you don't really look at what the work that they did you kind of just like question it but it's not in a not in a malice way or anything like that it's just in a way of like I've been doing the same thing or we've been you know running our business at the same time how did they get this luck kind of thing uh, so for me it was always about imposter syndrome because as many people that I watch on YouTube or any um, anyone that I follow on Instagram I always ask myself like I've been in it for this long I'm this old now like how come I'm not here you know but other people that have been following you also look up to you. And that was one of the things that had to click in my mind was um, for me being in streetwear. And like I said, in the beginning, there wasn't a lot of people that were doing it here in Calgary. I have now become the go-to when it, when it comes to uh, people starting their own clothing brands. So I didn't have that in the beginning, but now I am at this position where I can help other businesses and give my feedback. Where, where now I have to think, okay, well, I can't compare myself to this person that's like a millionaire in LA, but I can look at myself here and how can I help every other business become millionaires at the same time? Because at the end of the day, it's not about the, 
the quantity of what you're putting out there. It's all about the quality that you're helping build regardless of what it is. I would say for me, one of the, the biggest roadblocks is <clears throat> dealing with the fact that in my nine to five, I'm the leader, you know, I have a lot of knowledge, I coach, I train. And then on the side hustle, I'm still, you know, in the beginning. And it's like the complete opposite, right? I'm the, the novice, I'm still learning the ropes and stuff like that. I may not have all the information uh, that I want. I don't have the book of business that I want. So it's definitely a challenge, maybe a little bit of imposter, imposter syndrome as well. I'm not gonna lie. Uh, so that's definitely been the uh, a challenge um, that I'm dealing with. Yeah, it's so important to value your own time and what you're bringing to the table. Because when I was first starting out, um, clients would try to haggle and um, it was before I even knew that I should have contracts in place. And you can get burned quite easily when you're, when you're don't really, when you don't know or don't appreciate your own value. So once you get to a point where you've built enough confidence, and I mean, everyone's starting out, you should be confident in the services you're providing, um, but just protect yourself by having clients sign a contract. For me, um, I have clients give me a 50% deposit before I start work. And 99% of people are gonna be lovely, but it's that 1% that can burn you. And that was a really harsh realization for me when I was starting out. My biggest thing would be fear um, when you move towards a business where it's based off of contract work in the back of your mind, you could be like, if I lose all my clients tomorrow, I have no money to eat or pay the bills. But if you live in that mindset, then that's a, that's a place of fear. So, you know, just always having a positive mindset and knock on wood, I haven't lost one um, client yet. And, you know, some will come and go like as, as their businesses evolve or, you know, they can't afford it or, you know, I, I will never take offense to that. But I think also taking on clients that are good people. So when I, when I sit with clients, I'm also kind of interviewing them as much as they're interviewing me and seeing if it's going to be a fit. Um, right when I first launched and I really needed clients, I did sit down and I spent a significant amount of time with the client back and forth. And I kind of had a bad gut feeling and some energy that I felt that was a little bit off. And then um, long story short, she kind of said, oh, I thought you said your first month was free. And I definitely had it. And I knew it would be a long road ahead. So I set my boundaries and I said, you know what, until you can fully afford, you know, my, my package, let's connect next quarter. And I needed the money, but I knew my time was worth more than that. So um, yeah, I think the fear of failure is huge as an entrepreneur, um, but also setting those boundaries and picking the people that you are connecting with as well is huge because um, since values are huge for me, I'm going to align with, with similar companies and, and individuals and imposter syndrome. It's huge. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Okay, there's one last question. Um, do you have a succession plans? You're creating amazing businesses. Is the longer term plan to sell the business going into retirement or what happens? Uh, I have goals. My plans, the reason I have plans, but I felt like over all the years they kept changing. So I started modifying everything to short term goals, which can I accomplish this in three months? And then another one would be what's my, you know, what's my goal for next year? So I started setting goals as my succession plan but to be honest with you I will never retire uh, I just can't I can't think about not working um, I don't know if it's just in my blood my dad is also an aircraft structures technician he's 76 now he's been retired but he's still working as a contractor and he used to always tell me and all my instructors used to always tell me about my dad where it's like they always ask him about retirement and he says if he ever retires he's just gonna die quicker so for me it kind of just I always felt like when I thought about retirement when I think about it with my wife both of us work from home she's a copy uh copywriter and you know we have our own kind of businesses and we can't think about retiring it's just we love this so much that it kind of keeps us going so no plans for selling but also no plans for retirement only growing 
I love that. That just shows like you're doing what you love. And that's kind of the goal of the side hustle, right? Is to kind of test the waters, dip your toe into it, see if you like it, and then you can actually pursue it full time, which this is exactly what you're doing. So I love hearing that. Anyone else want to comment or do you want to wrap it up? I'll comment quick. Um, I haven't even thought about retirement because <laughs> I'm in the thick of it. Um, but I would say my dream is to just to grow my digital marketing agency, hire on passionate people, really train them up, make them feel empowered. Um, since we're in a digital age, I know there's so many creatives that prefer working at home. Um, and I've worked in environments where they want you nine to five and you at your desk. And I just want to have an environment where people can flourish, get your work done whenever you can, um, as long as it's done and um, just build my people up and make them feel amazing because I've worked in offices where I've had a great experience and I've worked in offices where I haven't. And so I want to build a positive, amazing atmosphere that people can, can feel empowered to grow. And if I ever do end up retiring, then I'll have built people and a culture that I trust that I can leave that in, in capable hands. I think for me, um, since I learned about the concept of FIRE, uh, financial independence and early retirement, I, I've i been paranoid about that. And that doesn't necessarily mean that I will ever stop working, right? But definitely breaking away from that nine to five uh, and setting up a diversified enough business that I can live off of passive income is the ultimate goal for me. Yeah, and I mean, I don't have any succession plan this my side hustle is truly just a way to supplement my lifestyle so um moving forward of course i want to be working with bigger and better clients and making more income but um just putting money away in rsps is is where i'm at right now awesome okay well i'm just gonna go ahead and wrap things up we we're almost at noon Thank you all, Jen, Albert, Kathy, Luis, for sharing your experiences. It's been um, incredible. And it's been great to see the chat going. People have really, um, it's resonated, so thank you. Um, and for those of you who joined us, thank you all for joining us today. Um, if you have any questions about how state alumni can continue to support you in your career, please don't hesitate to reach out by emailing alumni at state.ca. And like I mentioned earlier, we do have our alumni business directory where you can learn more about um, some of the businesses that fellow state alumni are running on their own. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.